Sweet, okay. What the enemy is here to do is deceive, lie, and rob us of the scripture and the truth. So we're not going to allow that, right? So I'm excited about tonight. I'm not used to using a handheld and trying to get my iPad stand open at the same time. Let's see if I can do it. There we go. But so if you've been with us, you know exactly where we're at. If you're new tonight, welcome uh, to our midweek service. We're in a year-long series of biblical literacy which is basically us just setting a whole year into looking at the text, looking at scripture, because after all, we are a church, and us being a church means that we dive into scripture. We don't just believe that scripture is, you know, part of our journey of faith where it's like prayer, where we, we, we know we could do better. We pray, you know, maybe for a meal, maybe before we go to bed, but we could always do better, or maybe even fasting. We believe that this is essential to our faith and is essential to us maturing in our faith. And so, We've set aside a whole year for us to look into the text, look into scripture, in hopes that you get into the text and get into the word. And so I'm excited about tonight. Um, So tonight is a a continuation in our little mini Sirai of the year of biblical literacy. It's the story of Israel. And really what we've kind of been discussing and what we've illuminated is that the story of Israel really is our story. It's the story of ups and downs, of of wins and fails, of successes and losses, but through it all, God is present and God is in it all. Amen? Amen. Amen. So tonight, we're going to be diving into Hebrews. So if you want to get out your Bible, you can go to Hebrews. We won't get it until the very end, but don't worry, we got it on the screen. I won't leave you guys out. So So sometime last year, I kind of realized that uh, I was having a hard time getting down and reading. I found myself kind of more so getting into podcasts. I would listen to audiobooks and whatever. Uh, I don't know exactly when it was, but I realized I was like, okay, I'm not sitting down, I'm not reading, and I'm not getting through a full book. How many of you can relate to that, right? Okay, good. I'm not alone. But if you, uh, if you kind of understand me, I like reading, I like learning. You're probably the same. You probably have some books that you bought that you haven't read yet, but you bought them last year and your goal is to read them this year and then you're gonna buy another book this year in hopes to read it at least by next year, right? So for me, I've gone on trips. I have books on my like TV stand. I have books on my nightstand. Um, I have books that I buy and then I give my wife so that way she can read and she can tell me what happens in the book. Um, I have books everywhere, right? You'll take a book on a trip knowing you're not going to get to it, but you take it on the trip because you want to feel studious, right? You want to feel like, yeah, I got somewhere. Well, in 1967, in this memoir of Frank Conroy, he he describes an initiation into his literature. And uh, he says this, I'd lie in bed and read one paperback after another until two or three in the morning. The real real world would dissolve, and I was free to drift in the fantasy, living a thousand lives, each one more powerful, more accessible, and more real than my own. Now, I might not be that, but I would say that my wife is that. So my wife can like literally read a whole book, if not like two books, on her phone. Like on her phone. Did you guys hear me? Like that is insane for me. I'm not that way. If I'm going to read a book, I want to sit down and I want to see where I am within the book, right? So for her, there's this kind of like one-to-one attention that she can develop, whether it's in a reading nook or if it's in an office chair or wherever it is. I'm jealous of that because there's a level of, of relationship to the text. It's not that it's a book to escape from reality, but more so it's to understand and interact with the world. Now, as I was kind of doing some research on this, David Eulin, he writes this, such a state is increasingly elusive in our over-networked culture. In every rumor, where, in which every rumor and mundanity is blogged and tweeted, today it seems it's, it is not contemplation we seek, but an odd sort of distraction, masquerading, sort of uh, as being in the know. And why? Because the illusion that illumination is based on speed, that it is more important to react than to think that we live in a culture in which something is attached to every bit of time. Reading allows us to slow down, right? If you've read a book, you, like, you want to get cozy. You want to get a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or whatever it is, and you want to sit down and slow down. I mean, just think of the podcast that you listen to. I'm guilty of it. I'm like times two speed, and I'm like listening to it, and then I have to listen to it a second time. And then I have to, at some point, pause it so that I can re-listen to what I was wanting to hear. 
but slowing allows us to, or reading allows us to slow down, and it's where we realize this idea or this construct of time. It's like when you're without a phone, at some point in time, you're waiting in the line at the grocery store, and he had nothing else to do, that kind of time where it's kind of like in the mixture of boredom, and it's like, okay, let me think about what's in my schedule, right? That, that, that construct of time. So contemplation is not only necessary, uh, or, or not only possible, but it's also necessary, especially for us in the faith, and especially in light of all of the overload that we face. In an essay collection, The Winter Sun, Fanny Howe quotes Simon Well, and he says, one must believe in the reality of time, otherwise one is just dreaming. And that's the point precisely. For without time, we lose this idea or this sense of narrative of what's going on between the lines or what's going on between relationship or what's going on between us and God and what God is ultimately doing within the church here and now. It's the most essential connection to who we are. We live in time, we understand it, we kind of have watches, we have Apple watches, we have smart watches, we have smart TVs, we have TVs that have, or fridges that have TVs on them that display the time. We can't escape this reality of time, so we understand it and our relation to it, but our culture has this idea of time collapsing into the ever-present now. And how do we pause? How do we, as, as followers of Jesus, how do we pause in a culture that expects us to know everything instantly? Or how do we ruminate and we are, when we are constantly expected to respond to what's happening and the questions that are happening around us? Or how do we immerse and say an emotion or a decision or even maybe even an idea when we are no longer willing to give ourselves the space or even the time to reflect on those things? It's more likely that we're able to uh, read, and if we're, if we're getting into it, it's maybe in like a cookbook, or if we're like looking at a, a recipe, or maybe you ventured into like the blog side, and you're like, hey, this person is really cool, and I'm going to follow them. I don't know if that's like too, it's like, okay, that's probably, that's outdated. It's more like vlogs now. Okay, yeah, it's vlogs for sure. So I don't know what it is for you, but you might get into reading. Maybe it's a comment section on a YouTube, on a video or whatever, but we, at some point, we, we get into this idea of reading, and there's, there's something about a new book, right? If you go to Barnes and, Nobles, Barnes and Nobles, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like the smell of a new book. Like there's something about literature. As I was kind of researching this, there was an article that I came upon that described what I was feeling about a book that I could not put in my own words. So draw your attention to the screens. In most cases, paper books have more obvious topography than on-screen text. An open paperback presents a reader with two clearly defined domains, the left and the right pages, right? And a total of eight corners with which to orientate oneself. A reader can focus on a single page of a paper book without losing sight of the whole book or the whole text. Uh, I would beg to differ. Sometimes I get a notification and I, yeah, I'm sorry. I get distracted. One can see where the book begins and ends and where one page is in relationship to those in the borders. One can even feel the thickness of the pages read in one hand and the pages to be read in the other. Turning the pages of the paper book is like leaving one footprint after another on the trail. There's a rhythm to it and a visible record of how far one has traveled within the text. All these features not only make text in a paper book easy navigable, easily navigable, they also make it easier to form a coherent mental map of the text. Now, for us, I don't think that we've forgotten how to read, but I think that it's essential for us to read and how many of us could, uh, could admit here tonight that we could essentially step up our game with reading, whether that's nonfiction, fiction, or even within scripture. So reading is kind of like this lost art. Not a lot of people sit down at a coffee shop to read. It's more like you take your homework to a coffee shop, right? Or you probably don't have like a reading nook, or if you do, like you bought a chair and you set it up and then you never, you never sat in it to read or anything of that sort. It's just kind of there for decoration or to like balance the room or some sort. But I would say, and I would venture to say that reading is a revolutionary act, an act of engagement in a culture that wants us to disengage. We don't thumb through like a good book anymore, but more so we casually listen to a podcast I'm guilty of it, or scroll through a blog, or scroll through something to just read it leisurely. 
Now, this says a lot about our, our attention. And attention is basically a lens into which we see not only our identity, but we also see our, we also see our desire or our desires. Whom do we want to become? And you know, what, what is the process of becoming that type of person or that type of character? And, and there's so many endless options and distractions and really kind of places that we could fall into, ruts that we can fall into when we begin to think of who we want to become. I'm like guilty of this. I watch a lot of YouTube videos. At one point in my, my life, I was literally looking up like uh, CEO morning routines. And it was like, wake up at 4 a.m. and make a cup of coffee and drink 12 ounces of water. And right before you go to bed, take a bath with candles and all this weird stuff. And I was just like, I'm going to try it. <laughs> and so I tried it. And I did it like one day and I was like, 4.30 is not my time to wake up. That's not my routine. I'll just kind of just do it, you know, by myself. I'll figure it out. I'll get it going, you know. So for you, I don't know what your routine is, but there's this idea of us maturing and becoming a certain person. Now, if you go back with me to the 1900s, you'll understand that the 1900s in the 20th century was actually called the progressive era that soon became the new era from 1900 to 1929. The 20th century, it began with, without planes, without televisions, without plasma or OLED TVs, right? And of course, it didn't have computers. These inventions came later on, but they radically transformed the way that we lived our lives within the US, partly because they were invented within the US, or some of them were. Now, this century of the 20th century witnessed a lot. It witnessed two world wars. It witnessed the Great Depression in the 1930s. It witnessed the Holocaust in Europe, the Cold War, the revolutionary uh, uh, social equality movements that happened, and then also the exploration of space, right? Now, for the 20th century, it was referred to as the Christian era. If you want to Google this, you can. It was referred to as the Christian era, which was now kind of more so called the common era. Now, as of 2001, and this is like, it's like so sad when you like encounter somebody and they were born like post 2000s, and you're like, oh my gosh, you were born in like what, 2007? Oh my goodness. But post 2001, right? That's when the 21st century was initiated and it's shifted from the Christian era now to the common era. And what now journalists are calling the 21st century, the digital age, the digital age. Now, for us, two decades into this digital age, right, how do we, as followers of the way, followers of Jesus, ha having leather or, or big, chunky study Bibles like this, how do we cultivate a love of reading in the midst of a digital age? How do we do that? Now, long before Christ came to live among us, right, he had given an immeasurable gift of grace. The immeasurable gift of grace that he gave to us was his revelation of himself, now, he gave of, gave of himself by telling of himself. So he gave of himself by telling of himself. In the ancient world, right, people believed in all sorts of different deities or gods, but these gods did not reveal themselves in the character of, these, uh, of themselves. Now, when you reveal yourself, right, you now have to act accordingly to what you have revealed. That's why when you're on your way to somewhere, you text, I'm on my way, not I'll be there by you know, such and such time, because more than likely, you're not going to show up at that time, right? So for, for God, when he reveals himself, he's revealing himself, and he's agreeing that he will commit to this. He's saying, this is who I am, and this is who you will get. Now, that's why for us, when we, we examine scripture and we look and we read about Abraham and we read about these times where God comes and he speaks, and, and like Abraham is like spoken to God by like, uh, or spoken to, spoke, God speaks to Abraham. Let me rephrase that. God speaks to Abraham like eight times, right? And we, we kind of like read the text and we're like, man, I wish God would speak to me now, right? Because he's the same. He revealed himself then, so he reveals himself. Where is God? I want to speak to him, right? But how many of you if, you, if you had a choice, would you choose one Oreo or would you choose the whole package of Oreos, right? Whole package, right? 
So for us, we don't have just eight conversations with God. We have 66 different books where we begin to see and understand the character of God, that it's the same throughout time, that it's the same then, and it's the same now. So when we open up Scripture, it's not like God isn't talking to us. It's a matter of fact, is, are there distractions going on around us that we're not allowing the Lord to speak into our life? Now, there's, if you look at and examine scripture, there's so much beauty within it. There's poetry, there's literature, there's, there's miracles, there's prophecies, there's promises, there's new beginnings, there's encouragements, there's, in, there's corrections. There's all sorts of things for us to be able to lean into, lean into the text and understand that God is present and that God is active in each and every day of our lives, whether we see it there or not. Now, there is a reason, right? There's a reason that people risk life and limb to smuggle leather, leather literature among and, and across borders. It's not because there's no truth in it. There is truth. There is new beginnings. There is promises. And there's truth that we can declare and promises that we can declare over our life. So we recognize that the Bible is focused on trying to get us information, right? It's trying to get us the information that Jesus came, right? His death, his life, his burial, his resurrection, everything of that sort. But we also understand, we call it God's revelation, that the Bible or scripture is God's revelation. If you've been in the church, you've heard that term, you know what it's about, right? We kind of understand that. But what happens when we hear this term over and over and over is that we kind of stop right there. We examine scripture, we bring our Bible to church, or we download it on our phone, and we never move into or carry into the next step, which is how we read the text and how we activate the text. And that's where our strategy has to pick up. So we've been doing this year-long series over biblical literature of reading into the text, but tonight I kind of want to expand on how we are to read into the text. Now, the Bible is, has really shaped a lot of the Western fabric whether you see it or not, we still, as a, a digital age, a, a post-Christian modern age, we still use the Bible to swear in officials and officiants, right? But not only does it have the ability to shape the Western fabric, but it also has the ability to shape even our own personal life. The mental maps that we've constructed of the world, our trust structures, the way that we deal with stress, and even be, the ability to shape our giving and our relationships. So for us, why set aside a whole year for this study? Because we believe that we're followers of Jesus and that we are called to read the text. We're called to read the Bible. We're called to, like as Jesus saw it, we're, Jesus was obsessed with scripture and we are to do the same. Jesus was, was obsessed with the Bible. He would teach from it. He would preach from it. He would memorize it. He would commit to it. He would literally use it in every form that he could. And, and Jesus is like this like, overqualified Sunday school teacher, right? He's deity, he's God in human form, and he's here and he's like, hey, this is the, tr the truth. If you wanna understand God, if you wanna understand the character of who my father is, look to the text. Now, if, you're, if you've ever been to like an orchestra, raise your hand, I wanna see who's been to an orchestra. Okay, I was not a fan until my, my wife kind of convinced me, and so we went to like the... Uh, we went to the uh, new Lubbock um, Ballet, Buddy Holly Center, and we heard the, the orchestra there. It was super cool. If you've ever seen like those old movies where like the, 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 the wealthier people are sitting up in like the, the fancy sections in the orchestra and everything, that sort of reminded me of, I was just like, wow, this is super, super cool. Because like you're way up there and then the orchestra's all the way down there. But if you've ever been to an orchestra, there's a, there's a point in the, the, the rehearsal that you can sit in and you can listen to them warming up, right? They warm up their lips, they warm up their hands, they warm up their instruments. And that's because they're practicing before the actual recital or the there, there's a rehearsal before there is a recital, right? So if you're a pianist, Nathan Moore, right? You don't just walk into the set and say, I'm just gonna read the music and call it good, right? That would not be good for anybody. That would not be good for the, the band members. That would not be good for you all. That would not be good for me, right? It wouldn't be good because why? Because there's an element of practice that it brings this, this instinct into the performance. That as you begin to practice, it becomes muscle memory that as you begin to step in, you understand, oh, I can throw this over this and this will sound really good blended with this. So hey, if you do this, and as you practice, you begin to, to build upon that skill and it becomes instinctive 
when the, the situation arises, right? So for us, it's the same thing for Scripture. Scripture is not just something that you just sit down, you, you know, open your Bible and you're like, Lord, speak to me. And you open it up and it's upside down and you're like, what is that one? I've never heard of that book of the Bible, right? It's not something that we just step into, that we read, but it's something that we meditate on. Scripture is very vocal about that, that we don't just meditate on silence or we don't just meditate on good stuff. We meditate on the truth from Scripture. And how do we meditate on the truth from Scripture? is we get into the scripture. We practice and we practice and we practice. We train in the language of the New Testament. So for us, three basic steps that I wanna leave with you tonight. I'm not usually like a point guy, I'm more of like a quote and scripture guy, but I got three points for you guys, all right? So hermeneutics, have you heard of the term? Okay, so hermeneutics is basically the translation or interpretation of the text. It's how we bring the context out of the text for us to understand it. So the first step in hermeneutics is for us to understand the revelation. You can kind of like, you can term it as air. It's A-I-R, or if, if you want to do it inverted, it's R-I-A. But there's revelation to the text, right? So what is the revelation? What's being revealed in this specific text? What do we know from the historical context, not just from chapter three, verse two, but what do we know that was going on within the church? What do we know that was going on within the political time? What is being revealed that we know of and what has been revealed in the past that we can provide context into the text? So what do we know from the historical times, from the cultural times, and then what's, what has scripture already revealed about this passage or this scripture? Because oftentimes scripture will reveal or interpret scripture itself. We don't have to do that. Now, the second part of this is interpretation, right? So is my interpretation adequate? So meaning, does it explain everything in the text? Is there a part that's missing? Am I vague on this part? Did I answer this thoroughly? Is it adequate? Is it consistent with the other text that I've seen? When I open this up, am I able to effectively consider the current cultural moments that are happening? And does it relate to this, right? Is it relevant? Uh, or is it, is it what's, what's being revealed? The interpretation, is it coherent? And then also the application. So the application is very simple, it's straightforward. How does it apply to me? Am I supposed to go, like we looked at 2 Samuel, right? Am I supposed to go on a trail run with a spear and go chase my fellow friends? No, probably not, right? How does this apply to me? And how do I respond to this specific text? Now, Jen Zimmerman, he has a book over this, and it's like the basic steps. It's like 101, kind of like her hermeneutics for dummies, right? And I would actually recommend this book because it's very, very insightful. In, in his book, he quotes, he says, hermeneutics actually shows us that we don't actually perceive the world by seeing first objects and then clothing them with meaning afterward. Rather, every act of seeing is putting together in a certain way based on our own personal history, our own culture, and our own traditions even our own professions make us see a certain way. So basically, we're biased in not only the way that we interpret things, but we're also biased in the way that we seek out information. You'll know this by when you're in an argument, you Google the answer that you want so that way you can prove that person wrong, so that way you don't have to listen to what they're saying, right? We're biased in even the knowledge that we want to consume. Now, there's a core term. It's called fusion of horizons. And I think that's a beautiful, like, literature, uh, a way of, of expressing what, this, what hermeneutics does. So the nature of understanding is integrating that which is unfamiliar to us in our own familiar context. So the nature of understanding is integrating that which is unfamiliar in a, in, to us into our own familiar context. So when we understand something, right, we fuse someone else's perspective or viewpoint to our own. That which cannot be seen is now seen. And that's a, that's a way of us fusing understanding or a fusing maturity into our life or into our situation, the fusion of horizons. Now, you don't need a semi seminary degree to read the Bible. I can always recommend that. You don't need it, right? You don't need to go take a bunch of courses and spend two years on how to understand the Bible. But I would say that it is worth your time to understand the Bible by reading into what people have, you know, completed degrees on and wrote about how to understand the Bible. So you don't need a seminary degree. You don't need two hours every morning with your, you know, 
Pastor Mickey size hermeneutics dictionary, right? Greek dictionary, you don't need that. But I would say that you need a level of skill, hermeneutics, and that you also do need a level of acumen to understand what's happening within the Bible. So what we first have to understand is the Bible is written. It's not a, a video. It's not a lecture. It's a narrative. And it's often, there's, there's different types of, of literature found within scripture, but it is written. And because it is written, it is authoritative to us. Now, this is, this is familiar to you because when your boss emails you, right, it's an email, it's written email, it's mail, it's internet mail. So it's written, right? You have to follow through with that task because it's a written assignment based off of somebody who's over you. Now, for you, as you're on your way home and your wife texts you, right? Hey, honey, could you get some paprika on your way home? That is a written assignment for you. There's authority in that assignment and you will obey that assignment, right? Or take it even further, like you're, you know, driving down the road and you see a speed limit. The cop is going to say that written speed limit, right, is authoritative. And if you don't think it's authoritative, I'm going to give you a piece of paper that is going to be authoritative, right? So there is authority within voice and also within text. And for us, as we look into Scripture, we understand that it is a written covenant, and it's authoritative not to just a blanket statement, America. It's authoritative to those who are under covenant or in covenant with the Father, right? So for us as followers of Jesus, Scripture is authoritative to us. Now, sometimes... We in our flesh do not want to be rebuked or corrected, but we have to understand when rebuke or correction is coming our way, it's not coming because that person has an ego thing, maybe so, but more importantly, for a mature follower of Christ, you understand that if it's coming from truth, from scripture, you submit to not that person, but you submit to scripture. And in that submission, you honor those who are calling you to submit or basically calling you to be corrected, right? Amen, yeah. Now, it's true for those who aren't followers, for your neighbor, maybe your store manager, for the people that live next door, for your classmate who might be a Buddhist. It's true for them. It explains how to be a better human, but that is not it. It's not just to how to be a better human. It's not just for us to look at it and say, oh, that's a great prayer. I'm going to put it on a coffee mug or put it on a shirt and, you know, be happy. For us, as we turn the pages, we uncover the truth about the kingdom of God. Now, in the West, authority was vested more so in the kind of like the biblical professions or even in priests, and it's kind of shifted from there. The following age of enlightenment, authority was was kind of more positioned towards or vested in science and education. Um, This is why like when you would go to school and your professor would say something, you would believe it, or when you would explain something and you would say, my professor said this, everybody was like, hmm, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Or when you, a new study came out on dieting, it was like, okay, this one is it. And then the next year it changes, right? That's always how it goes. But in the postmodern, in the era that we live in, in the digital age, it's the autonomous self. It's you have your own opinion, and that's all that matters. And maybe if you want, it's your third therapist because you've gone through that many, and you found the one that will echo what you want to hear, right? So Western culture has been conditioned to think that tradition is the opposite of critical thinking, that it's, it's not really there to serve us, but we have to understand that tradition is the initial tools to help us discover what truth actually is. So I propose to you that if you do not submit, right, you cannot die, and if you cannot die, you can never be reborn. So submitting to Scripture allows us to die to self or to die to flesh that allows new life to become part of our own life. It allows the Holy Spirit to come to redeem, to, to, to renew, to replenish, and to give us a new perspective, not just a, a great story for us to share on a Sunday and then go about our, our daily day, day-to-day life. It's a way of life for us. As we examine Scripture, we understand that it not only transforms us, but it also at the same time matures us It matures us emotionally and spiritually. Now, for us, as we examine Scripture, as we looked at it in the Old Testament, right, there's a lot of weird stories that we're not familiar with or we are familiar with, and we're like, this, what? Oh, my gosh. Did I read that right, right? You're like, maybe I should switch translations, right? There's There's not a lot of points where we're like, this person is a clear role model because when they do a great act, 
later on in that book or later on in that chapter, there's this egregious act that they commit that really we would say is, is, is not role model-esque or, or, you know, the example, example that we want to follow. But as we open up scripture, as we make our way past, you know, Abraham, as we make our pa- way past Moses or Ruth or Esther or Joshua or even David, we understand that these are supporting characters that are pointing to who? Jesus. So as we look at scripture, we understand that these are supporting characters echoing the story of God. So if we've been in this kind of like this series of the story of Israel. We understand that the story of Israel is our story. And basically, the story of Israel points to the story of God. The story of God, which is a story of redemption, of taking that which is lost and bringing it in in to his own, into his own house, into his own name, and into his own family. Now, let me scroll down in my notes. So when we read scripture, when we read this narrative, right, we ought to be asking not what is God doing in this character, But what can we see of God's character in this character? How can we see God moving in this whole text, not just in this verse, not just in this tiny little passage, but how can we examine the full, doing hermeneutics, how can we examine the full text and see the truth that is coming out of that text? That's why I cannot encourage enough. These like study Bibles, they make you look really cool. They're like wrapped pretty cool too. They're not like old school leather. And they provide so much context that you can read into the cultural times and what's happening and why the church was acting this way in that specific region. Now, the more we know about the character of God, the more we know and how we relate to the character of God. So I had a friend who went on a missions trip and it was really cool because he he was in basically right near Dubai and he was explaining his his whole missions trip. He was there for like I think he was like seven months. He was there for a really long time. He was planting with this church and he was explaining the gospel to these people who had never heard the gospel or who had heard the gospel, but it was just not there in their day and age, right? In their culture. And so he's explaining it right. And he says, one of the most effective conversation starters that I had was, hey, are you spiritual? And of course they would open up. But he would begin to explain to them, the more that we understand about the character of God, the more that we can relate to the character of God. So the more that we get into the text, the more that we understand that he was this way here and he's this way over here, that as we understand that Jesus was on the road to Emmaus, he turned back to the Old Testament. So it's not something that we fear, but it's something that we turn to and we understand who God is. Now, Hebrews 12, if you've kept your place there, props to you. If you haven't, I'll give you a second. Hebrews 12, we're going to start in verse 1. Hebrews 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, don't get confused when it says great great cloud of witnesses. It doesn't mean that um, we're talking about witness like a, a person that's watching you, but it's talking about somebody who's who's given testimony, who's, who's bared witness, right? Like in a case or a trial. He says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. All that we experience throughout life is full of obstacles, right? I mean, we're reminded of it this week. There's, there's troubles, there's pain, there's heartache, there's, there's pebbles that we trip over and there's boulders that we have to leap over, right? And isn't, isn't it fascinating that as we examine scripture, we have one of the greatest disciples of Jesus, right? Writing to us and saying, hey, there's people who have already lived this life, who have had great successes, but at the same time have had great failures, who have lost it all, have been humiliated, have been humbled, but at the same time have been exalted by the Most High. They are bearing witness And they are giving testimony. They are championing you as you walk about your day, as you check your phone, as you read, as you drive to work. They are calling you to throw off the hindrances, the things of the flesh, the distractions, the past verbiage that you've used, throwing off the immaturity that you've been labeled with, throwing it off and throwing off the sin that so easily entangles us so that we can bear witness, so we can step into relationship, right? It says, 
And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Amen. That is such a good verse. So my prayer for you tonight in this series of a year of biblical literacy is that we as a community, that we would commit to a year, that we would invest in reading, that we'd invest in scripture, that we'd invest in buying a Bible if we don't have a Bible. Downloading the Bible app is not enough, I promise you. My hope is that we as a community would step into scripture, that we'd allow the narrative of God working through Israel to understand his character and see how he's working even in our own life. There's, there's this idea that as we look at scripture, we understand that we don't just look to King David or King Saul or Samuel or Nathan or Jonathan or whoever, right? When we look at scripture, we don't look to them and how they solve their problem, but we understand that they look to God as, they, as he solved their problem. So it's not like this is like a cheat sheet or a manual for us to get out of jail or get out of trouble really quick and then get back to our day-to-day -day life. But it's an example for us to turn and to understand that the character of God is that he delivers and that he brings back restoration and he brings back fruition to those who humble themselves and follow after his son. So in closing, I wanna just leave you guys with a verse. It's John 5, 39. This is Jesus talking, right? He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness to me. As we uncover the text, we are bearing witness to the one who has called us by name, has chosen us and has set us apart to do good works that we have not encountered yet, to meet people that we have not encountered yet, to bless people that we have not encountered yet. So the way that we're living, if it does not match with the character of God or the promises of God or the truth of God or the truth of scripture, then I challenge you tonight in this moment of worship to respond, to, to step into faith, to step into scripture and to see how the Lord can call forth the dry bones and call you into fruition. Amen. Well, let's worship.